webinar, the ATA Advocacy Update. We always look forward to ATA's update as it is one of our more popular annual pre presentations. My name is Kent Ferguson, Director of Transportation Solutions for Higher Right. I will be your moderator for today's webinar session. Our goal is to keep the presentation to 45 minutes and then open it up for questions. The presentation was prepared today for informational purposes only. It is not intended to be substituted for legal advice. Should you have any legal questions, please direct them to your legal counsel. Before we begin, I have a few housekeeping items that I need to cover. We will not be providing copies of today's slides. However, we will send you an email tomorrow with a link to the recorded webinar session that you can share with your team. If you are experiencing any audio or visual issues, please refresh the browser window by clicking F5, that's Plank 5, on your keyboard, or let us know through the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. We will take questions at the conclusion of the webinar. To type your question, select the Q&A widget in the taskbar at the bottom of your screen. We will try to answer these during the webinar, but if we run out of time, we will follow up with an answer later via email. After the presentation, we would appreciate getting your feedback, so please take our short survey. Let us know if this session was valuable and if you have any ideas for future topics. Finally, during this webinar, please tweet using hashtag HireRightWebinar. Following the webinar, the most engaged Twitter participant will receive an exclusive thank you package from HireRight. Now for our guest speakers. Today we have Sean Garney and Henry Hanscom from ATA. Sean Garney is Director of Safety Policy for ATA and works with industry stakeholders to analyze and inform on current and pending regulation and legislation. Previously, Sean was the manager of safety programs where he helped trucking companies develop and disseminate effective safety programs. He joined ATA in 2007. Prior to that, worked in transportation sales and as a freight broker at C.H. Robinson Company. Henry Hanscom is Vice President of Legislative Affairs for ATA, and his primary focus is on the Senate. He covers issues including infrastructure funding, regulatory reform, driver shortage, and many others. Henry joined ATA in 2013, and before that worked for Senator Olympia Snow up until her retirement. So that's our introductions. Uh, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Henry. Henry? Hey, Ken. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, certainly appreciate the opportunity to be with you all today. Um, as Ken mentioned, my name is Henry Hanscom. I'm one of ATA's lobbyists. Today, I'm, I'm here to provide a brief update from D.C. Uh, there's a lot going on, and I want to talk about some of our top legislative priorities and how they are positioned moving forward in the 115th Congress. So without further ado, here goes. All right, Trump hits the ground running. <clears throat> so as we all know, President Trump took the oath of office on January 20th, now the 45th President of the United States. I think that was a surprise to a lot of us, uh, Republicans and Democrats alike. Um, few predicted his win, um, but I believe ATA was very well positioned for this scenario. We worked extensively with the Trump transition team as well as the Clinton transition team leading up to November, uh, and we really enhanced that outreach and education and advocacy with the Team Trump following the election and up to today. So in the first six months of this presidency, um, the administration has really worked to staff up to get the cabinet in place, to learn some of the ropes, and they've hit a few bumps along the way. In that effort, uh, one of the key things they've been working on is presidential appointments. Uh, they're responsible for roughly 4,000. This is a slow process for every administration, 
but one that's been uniquely slow for this administration. That's in part due to the pace at which they're vetting and nominating appointments, but also to the significant headwinds they're facing in the Senate confirmation process. Um, right now, Senate Democrats, for political purposes, are using procedural steps and maneuvers to slow walk the president's nominations, bringing things to a standstill. And to briefly draw a comparison to the previous administration, as we're approaching the August recess to date, the Senate has confirmed only 23% of President Trump's 216 nominations. Alternatively, in President Obama's first term, by the August recess, they had confirmed 69% of his 454 nominations. So these stats show that on one hand, the administration needs to move a lot more quickly in the nominating process. But on the other hand, uh, Democrats are slowing down the process, really trying to keep the administration operating on half strength or less. Um, but outside of the nominations, <clears throat> the administration has laid out a really ambitious agenda. We've all heard health care repeal, tax reform, infrastructure, trade, immigration, None of these are easy lists by any means, but each one could have real significant benefits for the country and the industry if accomplished. And we've all heard that further complicating things while the administration is getting their feet under them, they're continuing to experience headaches, you know, scandals according to the press, backlash from tweets, et cetera. So even though that's a lot of noise and distraction, it really hasn't helped the agenda moving forward or the administration's agenda moving forward. So accomplishments to date. The administration has a, had a lot of success so far rolling back several Obama-era regulations. They're also really focused on streamlining and cleaning up the regulatory process within the agencies. And, of course, they also had a really significant victory with the confirmation of Neil, Neil Gorsuch to the Supreme Court. So to the 115th Congress. As we know, the, the House and Senate were sworn in on the 3rd with a Republican majority in both the House and Senate. Um, a narrower majority than the last Congress. So what does that mean? In the House, Speaker Ryan holds a really unenviable job of holding together a Republican caucus um, for votes on all their issues that is really fractured at the moment. You've got the Freedom Caucus, the Republican Study Committee, you've got Republican moderates. Trying to meet all their demands, which often run counter to each other, is really difficult as they try to move forward and navigate major legislation, as we've seen this play out with the health care bill. And when you lose one of these groups, it's really hard to reach the 218 votes necessary to pass legislation with most, if not all, Democrats opposing. In the Senate, we've got a 52 to 48 majority, making it really difficult to move legislation when a 60-vote threshold is often needed to clear procedural hurdles. So what has the House been working on? Their focus to date has really been some of the Obama regulations, um, really focused on health care repeal, and committee work they are looking at tax reform, trade, AVs, uh, an FAA bill. In the Senate, they've been really focused on executive nominations and have also turned a lot of their focus to the health care debate. So one thing we've been hearing a lot from our members is we have a Republican White House, House of Representatives, and Senate. Why aren't we getting more done? Well, I think there's a couple of important answers to that question. One, the Trump administration is still trying to get its footing. Two, Senate Democrats are really slow walking nominations. Three, the House Republicans or their conferences really fractured with these different sub, sub caucuses. Four, the Senate majority is quickly defeated when just three Republicans oppose an issue, as we've seen with health care. Five, Democrats are really questioning the incentive to work across the aisle right now, and some think it's best to wait things out until the next election. And I think six, what's also important is that this is the first time since 2007 that Republicans have held the White House the House and the Senate. This means that we have a lot of members in Congress right now that don't have experience leading. The Republican Party spent the last eight years opposing um, the Obama administration, so now they've had to transition to the party in charge, and that's causing some growing pains. So where do we go from here? After painting that rosy backdrop, can Republicans and Democrats come together before the 18 elections? Short answer, I think, is yes. There are a lot of issues that both sides really want. You've got tax reform, infrastructure, avoiding the government shutdown, raising the debt limit. But not right now, Democrats aren't, aren't included in the legislative process and are really thinking it might be better to obstruct until we get to 18. 
make those elections a referendum on the president's and ability to accomplish you know, any major agenda items. But we've got several major legislative deadlines quickly approaching. So Republicans and Democrats are going to have to come together to work on things like the debt limit, government funding, the FAA reauthorization. So how is ATA moving forward on this with its legislative priorities in this Congress? While it's coming to a standstill in Congress, ATA continues to navigate through this legislative process um, and produce wins for the industry. In the 114th Congress, we were really successful with the highway bill, the FAST Act. Uh, we had successes you know, working on our hours of service issue, and we had some success on the tax extenders uh, package that was passed in 2015. So we have some real good headwinds to build from going into the 115th Congress. Looking to our number one legislative priority uh, for ATA's government affairs team, uh, entering the 115th Congress, we're continuing in our efforts to clarify federal preemption language for interstate commerce. This is known as F4A, or the Federal Aviation Administration Authorization Act of 1994. Without going too much into the weeds on this, this is the 1994 language that directed the federal regulations preempt state regulations relating to interstate commerce. This has been the law of the land since 94 and ensures that interstate trucking operates under a uniform set of rules, not a state-by-state -state patchwork. Unfortunately, in 2014, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals determined that California's intrastate meal and rest break standards should be applied to interstate trucking operating in the state. So this has created an operational nightmare for the industry, a trial lawyer's dream, and a clear need for Congress to step in and reestablish its intent from the original 94 bill. ATA has worked with Congress to address this issue over the past few years, initially in the FAST Act, the Highway Bill, and then the FAA Reauthorization Bill last year, and also in last year's Transportation Spending Bill. Unfortunately, uh, the clarification that we so desperately need has to date been delayed, but we're continuing to work aggressively with Congress uh, to resolve it this, this year. Right now, we are targeting both the FAA Reauthorization Bill, we have language in the Senate Bill, and we have champions in the House standing ready to offer an amendment when the bill comes to the floor. And in the 2018 fiscal year transportation spending bill, we have language in the House bill, and we are working with Senator appropriators on this issue as well. And what's important is that both of these vehicles are in play and they need a resolution by the fall. So we're optimistic that we can achieve some sort of resolution on this issue um, in the very near term. Transportation infrastructure. So as you all remember, um, then-candidate and now President Trump has talked a lot about his $1 trillion infrastructure package to rebuild roads, bridges, airports, ports, waterways. Um, this was exciting and welcome news for the industry on the campaign trail, and I think it continues to be a top priority for ATA. But the devil's in the details on this, and by details I mean how are we going to pay for it. Um, as some of you know, in response to both candidate Clinton and Trump talking infrastructure, in October, Chris Spear announced the formation of an infrastructure task force, and the committee was stood up early this winter. They have been tasked with reviewing and vetting funding proposals, determining what pay-fors we can accept, what pay-fors we must vehemently oppose. They've been meeting with members of Congress. They've been meeting with the White House. They've been actively, actively working to develop funding mechanisms that we can support. So, we, so we've been really plugged in on this issue, advocating and educating members of Congress, the Trump administration, and encouraging action, but the right action on an infrastructure package. And I, and I will say that the talk of public-private partnerships, of private investment in our infrastructure, it, it just doesn't work. Um, it doesn't work in rural America, and it often leads to tolling, which we as an industry, we as ATA, are adamantly opposed to. <clears throat> but there are a growing, growing number of members of Congress talking about the gas tax, which has been welcome news. And the president also raised this, uh, citing our, our meeting with him. So that, that funding mechanism, which we support, still remains on the table. And I think given that several states have taken action, Republican states have taken action to increase their fuel tax, there is less conversation from members of Congress about being, having their hands tied politically on this issue. And it's more turned into simply finding the political courage to act. Um, there also continues to be a lot of discussion around the repatriation of foreign assets as a pay-for, but some would prefer that money to be part of a larger tax reform package or go to paying down the deficit. 
So as far as timing for an infrastructure package, um, it still is the, remains the third priority for the administration after health care reform and tax reform. But as Congress struggles with health care reform and tax reform is no easier lift, uh, infrastructure may soon become the best option for the Trump administration, uh, desperate to put a win on the boards. So we're standing ready to work with the administration and Congress, achieve a robust infrastructure package, uh, but paid for in the right way. So federal tax reform. This is another top priority for the administration and Congress. Uh, ideally, the president wants to first pass health care reform, use some of those savings uh, to pursue tax reform, and then potentially tie tax reform to this $1 trillion infrastructure package. But with health care, uh, with a health care repeal tied up in Congress um, and the Senate and House committees that deal with this issue also dealing with tax reform, you know, tax reform has really been stalled. Um, nonetheless, we're continuing to work with the Finance and Ways and Means Committee to support efforts on this. Uh, we really feel that tax reform could be a major, uh, a, a major success and a major accomplishment for the industry. It will allow trucking companies to invest in new, safer, environmentally friendly equipment, uh, critical safety technologies, invest back in their operations and their drivers, really help the continued movement of our nation's goods. So in the ongoing conversations on Capitol Hill about how to achieve real tax reform, some of the things that we've called for is, are lowering the income tax rates on all business income, simplifying the tax code, retaining Section 1031 of the Internal Revenue Code, and working to eliminate the federal excise tax to encourage investment in safe and clean technologies. With respect to, uh, to trade, this is another critical issue, issue for the industry. As Chris Spear likes to say, trucking is synonymous with trade. So any action taken on trade deals cannot negatively impact uh, the movement of freight in and out of our country. President Trump and then candidate Trump has talked a lot about trade deals um, and the need for better deals. Specifically, he's targeted the Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP, and the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA. And since taking office, he's removed us from the TPP negotiations and has begun the process to review and renegotiate NAFTA. I think what's really important to note here is that with trucks moving 70% of the goods across the Canadian border and 83% of the goods across the Mexican border, any changes and or renegotiations to NAFTA must not harm the movement of goods. So we're continuing to monitor this process and weigh in with our positions and thoughts on it. Autonomous vehicle technology. This is really a new issue for Congress, but one that with the speed at which technology is emerging, Congress, federal agencies, the administration are really diving into. Um, and I think it's safe to say that AV technology has the potential to impact nearly all aspects of the trucking industry, <clears throat> bringing benefits in the areas of safety, environment, productivity, efficiency, and driver health and wellness. And given that, you know, there's a strong push to develop a policy and regulatory framework that will govern this technology moving forward. Unfortunately, in the early stages of the federal efforts, trucking was left out of the discussion. Last year, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration released a federal automated vehicles policy paper, a policy paper that would govern the industry, but one that did not include the industry or any input, you know, in the development. So this was unacceptable, and the industry made that clear and it was quickly remedied when Chris Beer was appointed to the DOT Advisory Committee on Automa Automation and Transportation. During this Congress, there have been several hearings, congressional roundtables in both the House and Senate discussing the safety implications of AV technology and the need for federal and state oversight of its advancements. Both the House and Senate are in early preliminary stages of developing legislation on this issue, and we've been very engaged with the House Energy and Commerce Committee, the Senate Commerce Committee as they move forward with their, with their separate bills. We're really enthusiastic about the promise of this technology, and we think it can dramatically improve safety, reduce accidents on our highways, and we're going to continue working closely with Congress and with the administration to ensure that the interests of the industry are included. And I think on one final point uh, on AV technology, we see this technology as driver assist, not driverless. We think it holds great potential benefit, um, but we don't believe that it will replace drivers or take away jobs but will instead improve operations and likely increase job opportunities not seen before in the industry. So that actually segues nicely into my next topic, driver shortage. 
Um, <clears throat> as you know, the industry is facing a severe shortage. Estimates have us at 48,000 drivers short as of 2015, due in large part to growth and the aging workforce. And if, if this current trend remains intact, the shortage could rise to around 175,000 by 2024. So this is a serious problem for the industry, but one without a silver bullet to fix it. ATA has been actively looking at several options and ideas to address this legislatively and within the agencies. We believe more can be done with our younger drivers, looking at the 21-year-old uh, requirement to drive interstate versus the 18-year-old requirement to drive intrastate. We had worked on that in the FAST Act, and we think there's more opportunities there. We also want to continue streamlining the process by which military personnel can join our industry. Um, there have been multiple bills in the House and Senate this year, including those by Representative Aguilar of California, Woodall of Georgia. Um, both were unanimously passed by the House. In the Senate, Senator Cornyn has introduced companion legislation. Um, we've endorsed both of all of these proposals, and we're going to continue working on this issue with Congress to find creative ways to address it. Additionally, we're in the initial stages of working with the Department of Transportation and the Department of Labor um, to find ways to better <clears throat> target existing workforce dollars and job training programs to address our driver shortage. And finally, uh, on redundant background checks, uh, this is another major issue for our industry and one that's been around for a long time, the need for a single robust federal background check for drivers. Currently, drivers are subject to multiple background checks, uh, hauling hazmat, uh, entering port facilities, chemical facilities, airports crossing the border. Um, we take security very seriously uh, and support the use of security background checks, but many of these background checks are similar, if not identical, and result in a loss of time and money for drivers without increasing security. So last year, in the 2016 National Defense Authorization Act, we worked to include uh, language championed by the ATA Government Freight Conference that allows the use of TWIC to gain access to military installations. And this year we built all that, uh, working with the Senate Commerce Committee to include language in the Surface Transportation Maritime Security Act, which was passed out of committee, that would allow for the use of TWIC, um, uh, TWIC background check to be used as proof that a person applying for a hazmat endorsement does not pose a national security threat. And in the Department of Homeland Security Reauthorization Act, uh, passed by the House last week, we were able to include language allowing states to use valid TWIC cards as an acceptable background check to receive hazmat endorsements as well. So although these are modest steps forward um, towards a single robust background check, there are steps in the right direction and we're going to continue pushing that issue forward. And that's what I have so far on the legislative update and I'll turn it over to Sean for a regulatory update. Great, thanks Henry. Um, as Henry mentioned, I'm going to be talking about sort of uh, what's happening in safety regulation. He handles the uh, the Capitol Hill and the legislative side of the House, and, and I work primarily with the administration and the regula regulating agencies, specifically FMCSA. So let's talk safety. I think uh, anytime I've talked about safety, uh, one of the first topics is always hours of service. And Without belaboring uh, the point and the history here, uh, uh, I think we all recognize that in 2011, FMCSA passed a final rule that significantly altered the hours of service requirements. Uh, one of the most contentious changes was the, ch the additional restrictions added to the 34-hour restart. Uh, those, those rules stipulated that in order for a driver to be able to reset his weekly hours, they needed to take a 34-hour restart, which included two consecutive periods of time between 1 a.m. and 5 a.m., that's two overnight periods, and it also restricted its use to only once in every 168 hours, which, of course, is seven days for anybody uh, keeping score at home. Now, the industry uh, naturally had some very serious concerns with the 34-hour restart restrictions uh, beyond the fact that it would probably negatively impact productivity and efficiency. Mainly, we had very serious and real safety concerns. Uh, first of all, how would it change uh, driver habits and patterns? Would it, would it move more trucks to be driving during the day, which of course is a, is a higher risk time of the day to drive, daytime driving means more interaction with passenger vehicles and casual motorists, which, which increases crash risk. And number two, we thought that the safety impacts 
uh, expected or uh, estimated by FMCSA were potentially dubious and, and uh, that the fatigue the fatigue improvements might not actually materialize. Now, over uh, a number of years and a number of vehicles, Congress has, has weighed in with FMCSA and said, hey, I'm not so sure these restrictions were the right way to go. So, you know what, let's go back to the simple 34-hour restart, the one the industry has been operating under for years and years. And why don't you all, you all being FMCSA, go back to the table and do a field study to to observe drivers in the field while they operate under the 34 restart restrictions and and or the uh the simple 34 restart uh, in later vehicles they also said well hey you know what you're going to have to suspend those that those 34 restart restrictions the industry will continue to operate under the simple restart and oh by the way if that study that you're doing if that comes out and does not indicate that the restart restrictions showed a safety benefit well, then the industry is going to continue to operate under the simple 34-hour restart. Uh, so uh, for about three years, the industry waited on bated breath for the results of this 34-hour restart study. Uh, that study was finally released this spring. And um, as sort of expected, in every category that the agency studied, they could not show that the 34-hour restart restrictions resulted in in a net benefit so under the operational category the the study showed that drivers operating under the simple restart did not work significantly longer hours uh, which was also true for drivers that uh, used the simple restart more than once a week the same was true in safety drivers using the simple restart did not show uh, a measurable increase in number of safety critical events that sort of hard braking or lane departure uh, warnings and the same goes for whether or not they were using the 34 hour restart more than once a week uh, fatigue same story simple restart drivers using the simple restart did not show additional uh, or rather were not more fatigued than those using the restart containing the 30 the overnight restrictions and uh, same goes for whether or not they were using it once a week or, or more often. Also, uh, self-reported increased perceived stress did not increase uh, when a driver used a simple restart over the 34-hour restart restrictions. So as you can see, in every category, FMCSA failed to prove that the 34-hour restart restrictions they had proposed increased driver safety. And so as a result, uh, they were unable to reinstitute the 34-hour restart restrictions, and uh, the industry, for the foreseeable future, will continue to operate under the 34-hour restriction, or the 34-hour restart that we, of course, know and love. There was some talk during during this process, during these intervening years, as to whether or not uh, FMCSA or DOT might eliminate the restart altogether. And here there was good news in the report as well. Uh, one of the conclusions of the report was that regardless of the restart restrictions used, there was evidence that the restart benefited the ability of drivers to get some recovery from work stress, cumulative fatigue, and chronic sleep restrictions. And what that says is, uh, you know what, the 34-hour restart restrictions did not improve safety, but the 34-hour restart itself is important and should be preserved. So I think that's good news to the industry, and we'll continue to uh, to look forward to operating into the simple 34-hour restart that we've begun to rely on. I am having some technical difficulties. Uh, I'm not sure if if others on the call can see my, oh, there, my next slide just popped up. So uh, another topic of interest lately in hours of service has been uh, the split sleeper berth provision. Uh, those of you that use a sleep, sleeper berth provision know that it's a little bit too rigid uh, and that in, in Increased flexibility in that provision would certainly would certainly benefit trucking and would certainly benefit drivers. Uh, the idea here is quite simple: drivers should have the flexibility to rest while sleepy and to drive while alert. When the sleep birth provision was initially promulgated uh, way back in the day, they were operating under under the assumption that a cumulative cumulative fatigue, no matter what time it's you, their cumulative sleep or consolidated sleep, no matter what time it happens, day or night, 
is always superior to split sleep, so sleeping in smaller bursts. It's always better to sleep eight hours straight rather than two periods of time of four hours. Uh, more recent research, however, has indicated that that might not be true, that consolidated nighttime sleep is certainly superior, uh, but that consolidated but that split sleep is more beneficial than consolidated daytime sleep. Uh, as this research uh, came out, ATA and, and a number of other stakeholders uh, went to FMCSA and said, hey, I think you might have this wrong, and I think additional flexibility in the sleeper birth provisions could really improve safety, excuse me, and, and help help uh, help trucking companies as well. And so ATA, along with the Minnesota Trucking Association, uh, put together a pilot project program, took it to FMCSA and said, hey, guys, I think uh, if you use this pilot program and studied how these drivers uh, might improve their their fatigue scenario under the additional flexibility of the split sleeper berth, um, that you'll find that, that additional flexibility is warranted. FMCSA uh, took our proposal, and while they didn't uh, use that specifically, it, it did sort of encourage them to produce their own proposal, which we uh, saw published just this last spring. What they expect to do is to study approximately 200 drivers over the course of 90 days, and those drivers will be allowed to uh, choose which sleeper berth provision they want to operate under, the traditional 8-2 uh, and two provision, or one that allows them to split their sleeper berth time into two periods of time uh, as long as neither is less than three hours. And, of course, they'll study the differences between those two, two groups of drivers using traditional sort of uh, study metrics that we've we've that have become synonymous with with fatigue uh, with fatigue study and that is of course uh, hours of service logs using ELDs uh, onboard monitoring devices which will uh, monitor safety critical events uh, various uh, sort of sleep surveys and response time apparatus and of course they'll monitor uh, how much drivers sleep and and how fatigued they feel uh, the, the timeline for this particular uh, program is uh, is a little elongated. We expect uh, recruiting for the split sleep birth program to start uh, hopefully sometime this fall. Uh, start to finish, I think, with recruiting, uh, study, and then producing the report, peer review, et cetera. Uh, we'll probably look at a little over two years from start to finish when uh, by the time we see this final report. But we're hopeful that the report will indicate as we – uh, as we suspect, which is that additional flexibility to the sleeper birth program does in fact improve safety, and that that will, uh, over the long run, hopefully lead to uh, to a change in that uh, restrictive provision. Uh, I want to talk briefly the next topic here: electronic logging devices. I don't want to belabor the point or or go really deep into the weeds on this, and I'm ha happy to answer any questions that you all may have. But I did want to take a moment to sort of answer some very basic questions and dispel some myths about the electronic logging device mandate uh, and, and what it's supposed to do and um, what's going to happen moving forward. So uh, the first question I get all the time is, hey, does this ELD mandate, does this apply to me? And I think to answer that question, you've got to ask yourself several questions. The first is, do my drivers keep paper logs? Are they required to track their hours of service using their traditional paper record of duty status? If the answer to that question is yes, then you will have to begin logging electronically uh, in December of this year. Unless you answer this next question, how old are my trucks, uh, by saying they are all older than model year 2000. So if you have any trucks that are model year 2000 or older, uh, drivers operating that equipment will be exempt from the ELD rule, and that's because the computer inside of the truck sometimes has difficulty communicating with some of the ELD devices out there, so those trucks are, of course, exempt. Uh, and the final question is about timing, and the question is, do I use automatic onboard recording devices? If you're currently using one of these electronic devices to monitor hours of service, you will be given an additional two years uh, to convert that device to a compliant ELD device. Uh, in many cases, uh, we expect this conversion from AOBRD to ELD to uh, 
to happen with a simple over-the-air update, but you'll have to talk to your AOBRD vendor uh, to see what would be required to, to convert to an ELD. So uh, if you can answer those three questions, you should be able to decide whether or not this ELD rule applies to you altogether. Those of you whose drivers mostly operate in the short haul exemption and aren't required to maintain paper logs aren't going to be re required to uh, to use an electronic logging device to uh, to monitor their hours. The next question, which I get all the time, is, uh, did the hours of service rules change? And I can say uh, emphatically and confidently that uh, with the implementation of this ELD rule, the final rule did nothing, nothing to change the hours of service rules. They're exactly the same. The way that you operate now, uh, provided you are operating in a compliant manner, should not change as a result of simply logging your hours uh, instead of on a paper log on an electronic logging device. Uh, the difference is, of course, you'll save time because you won't have to stop and uh, record your information manually. You won't have to make the calculations on hours available. Uh, monitoring will certainly be a, a lot easier. So the hours of service rules have not changed at all. Uh, and the final question is, what is this thing going to look like in roadside? And, and this is the challenging question, I think. Uh, your electronic logging device, whichever you decide, will have either uh, a local way of trans transmit transmitting your data from your truck to uh, roadside or a telematic method. In, uh, in the event of a local transmission, uh, the roadside inspection officer would come up to the truck with a device, either an encrypted USB uh, 2.0 device, which you would insert into your uh, ELD, or a Bluetooth device in which you would have your, your ELD transmit via Bluetooth uh, the data to that device. They'd go back to their, uh, to their computer, enter it in, and check over your hours as they normally would. In the telematic solution, the law enforcement person would come up to your truck. You'd tell them that you have a telematic ELD device, and you would uh, transmit it in one of two ways. Either you would send it up to the cloud to, uh, to a web services platform that would unencrypt the information and shoot it down to uh, over the air to law enforcement, or you would have um, you would send the data to an FMCSA email, which would accept that data, would de-encrypt it, and then send it to the email of the law enforcement person who would then check your logs as they normally would. Now, if any of these, if any of these methods fail and you're unable to transmit electronically, say, for instance, uh, there's, there's poor connectivity or there's a malfunction in the law enforcement's uh, device, well, then there's always a backup option, right? And so, in this scenario, the law enforcement personnel would uh, would simply look at your device, at the display of your device, and would uh, look through your logs to determine whether or not there was a there was a logging violation, or uh, your device may be uh, may be able to produce a printed record of your uh, of your record of duty status, and that would be the backup in that scenario. So, a little look into uh, what the deadlines are. A uh, big question that we keep getting is, will the deadline uh, be delayed? Will there be a, a soft enforcement? What are you hearing on this front? Um, and what I can say from my perspective is that, you know, OIDA and the opponents to ELDs have exhausted all of their legal remedies. They've taken it to several different courts, several different appeals courts, and at every turn they've been turned back and said, and they've the court has agreed with the government and said that this rule is is reasonable and prudent and will stand. Uh, the Supreme Court in this spring decided to not take up the case, and so uh, the legal options are, are no longer available. The regulatory options, uh, sort of the same thing here. Uh, the rule is not eligible for the regulatory freeze. Uh, the agency generally, the agency certainly supports it, and Congress has supported it in the past. So we we don't expect any regulatory options as well. So with that, I can say that I'm fairly confident, I'm very confident, I'll say, that, that December 18, 2017 will be the deadline by which you'll have to find a way to electronically log your device in a compliant, or log your hours in a compliant fashion. So uh, what's, what's down the road here, looking into the crystal ball? Well, I think we'll, we'll continue to see more devices certified. 
Um, there are over 70 devices currently self-certified on uh, FMCSA's website. I think we'll see a big training, uh, an FMCSA enforcement training push. Uh, they've already started on this, but they expect a, a pretty strong push coming in August and through the fall to make sure that law enforcement is ready uh, to interact with you all and your devices on roadside. And of course, there's a couple exemption decisions that are sort of sitting out there. The first is uh, one of the most watched is one by the the Trailer Rental uh, Truck Rental and Leasing Association, who's requested exemptions uh, from the ELD rule for drivers operating short-term rental vehicles. Those are, are vehicles that are being rented for 30 days or less. Uh, and we expect that decision to come here sometime early this fall to make sure that everybody's ready. Now with that, uh, and I did see a question in the Q&A already about uh, what's happening on the Hill with regard to ELD. So if Henry is still with us, I'd like to pass that back over so that he may address those issues uh, as well. Henry? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Sean. Um, just wanted to quickly comment because there was a lot of noise on this last week. Um, what we saw is in the House Appropriations Committee uh, passed their transportation spending bill. It included an exemption for the livestock industry from being required to install ELDs during this fiscal year. Um, we've come out and communicated to the to the committee and to Congress that we oppose that effort. Um, we think that it would be best for the livestock industry to work with DOT and work with ELD manufacturers to ensure their concerns for their hours of service requirements are, are met um, with this coming uh, mandate. Also last week, uh, Representative Brian Babin from Texas introduced uh, a bill to delay the ELD implementation for two years. Um, what we think is using at best uh, specious arguments to push for the delay, it's attempting to accomplish at the last minute what they've been able to do in the courts, in Congress, with the agencies, um, roll back this common sense data supported regulation. Um, but with regard to that, this, is, this bill is going nowhere. Um, we've communicated with the TNI committee, the authorizers um, in transportation. They're not going to take it up. We've communicated with the Department of Transportation. They're opposed to this push. Um, this is moving forward, but we as, we as ATA are working to push back and communicate our position on this issue with members of Congress because, unfortunately, um, you know this this issue is being misrepresented in transportation magazines and you know by by the supporters of this effort so we're really working to push back um but we have you know we we believe it will be resoundingly rejected um and that's all I've got Sean Great. Thanks, Henry. And I can see that we've already had a, a number of questions on this. We'll, we'll work on answering them at the end of the webinar, but if we don't get to them, um, HireRight will, will forward those to us and we'll be sure to, to respond to each one. Um, with the, a couple minutes left, uh, making sure that we leave time for questions here, I want to talk about uh, CSA. There's been some big, big developments in CSA recently. Uh, going back to the FAST Act in uh, late 2015, Congress passed uh, passed a provision in that legislation responding to stakeholder concerns about the accuracy and reliability of CSA. Uh, in that, they required FMCSA to contract with the National Academies of Sciences uh, and ask them to study CSA in a very, uh, very in-depth way to, to look at its uh, reliability and its um, dependability, its data sufficiency. And while they're doing that, uh, the scores were removed from public view, which I'm sure you're all aware of. Your percentile scores and all of the alerts were taken down from the public website uh, while this happens. Um, the National Academies of Sciences released their study in June of this year. I'm sure we've all read in the press some of the some of the instant responses there, the, the study did find that that the decisions FMCSA made while uh, building their system were reasonable and that the, the system as it stood was defensible. But what they also found was that, they, that it, was, it, it was in some ways ad hoc and based on subject matter experts rather than sufficiently empirically validated. And with that came a number of recommendations on ways to improve the data and the accuracy of the system. One of the major recommendations was uh, a suggestion that FMCSA sort of scrap the system they were using and move to a model called the item response theory model. This is a data intense model which can, which can account for a lot of different variables, can self-calibrate uh, to figure out what, what violation weights are best, what, what time weights are best, 
what violations belong in which basics. It's a fairly dynamic and extremely data-heavy model, uh, which they've suggested. They've also suggested improving carrier exposure data. We all know that often CSA, uh, what, what impacts CSA more than how a carrier operates can be where a carrier operates. Uh, that's regional geographic enforcement disparities, things like uh, getting uh, vehicle maintenance violations in Texas because they just simply write more of those and how does that impact your score, uh, that kind of thing. So they've, they've asked FMCSA to look into better ways to find exposure data, to find vehicle miles traveled and power unit data. Uh, they've, they've also uh, controversially asked that FMCSA find ways to collect additional carrier data. And what we're looking at here, what they've suggested is uh, things like the commodities carriers are, are hauling and in what lanes, and uh, m perhaps most controversially, uh, how much they're paying their drivers and uh, in which way. So are you paying hourly versus uh, by the mile? How much are you paying your drivers? Uh, and, and how does that impact their safety? They've also suggested that FMCSA look into using both uh, your relative percentile rank as well as your underlying measure to determine whether or not you should be alert uh, in an attempt to take some of the variability away uh, in the case where a carrier is actually improving but is still in alert status or that a carrier hasn't, hasn't, hasn't gone backwards in safety uh, but is put into alert status because of the actions of their peers. Uh, and then finally, they re recommended that FMCSA study the public availability of this data, uh, how third parties use this data, uh, and whether or not that's, that's appropriate. Um, another thing that we've been following closely is, is a, this accident preventability demonstration program. Uh, this was, this was, a long time priority for ATA, uh, the reasoning is, is extremely simple. If my driver could not have printed, prevented a crash that he or she was involved in, that crash is not indicative of the safety culture and safety posture of my, of my trucking company and therefore uh, should not be included in the calculation of any safety metrics. And we've been arguing this for an awful long time and on Friday came the culmination of, a, of several years of advocacy when FMCSA finally uh, published on their website details of a program designed to allow motor carriers to uh, request review of accidents of certain types to determine whether or not they were in fact preventable. Those accidents include those accident types are sort of designed or are, have been have been identified because they are accidents that generally speaking are fairly easy to determine the preventability of for example uh, if my truck was struck by an opposing driver who was under the influence or driving in the wrong direction uh, on a highway if my truck was struck in the rear or was legally stopped while struck or in the case of a number of uh, single vehicle accidents if uh, I was a victim of suicide by truck. Somebody stepped in front of my truck in, a, in an effort to end their life. Or if I ran over an animal, which caused disabling damage. If a truck fell on my, or if a, if a bridge fell on my truck, that should be non-preventable. I should be able to, uh, to contest that as well. Um, the system's gonna work generally by allowing motor carriers to use the data queue system to request review of the preventability, preventable accidents. Um, once a preliminary determination is made, there'll be a, a, a chance for third parties of the public to uh, provide differing evidence. Uh, and then once that final determination is complete, uh, those accidents will be noted as such on your CSA profile and uh, your scores will be recalculated. So you'll show two scores now for logged in users. You'll show your crash indicator basic without the non-preventable accident calculated without that accident and then another score with it calculated with that accident in and the idea is over the course of two years to try to understand what sort of impact removing these accidents will have on carriers on carrier csa scores so uh, that that program is due to begin uh, august 1st and motor carriers will be able to contest accidents that happened on or after june 1st 2017. So uh, looking into my crystal ball here for compliance, safety, and accountability, 
Uh, FMCSA is scheduled to produce a corrective action plan, which will respond to the National Academies of Sciences uh, study of CSA. They're going to have to tell uh, Congress how they how they intend on altering the system to to respond to these. They've already reached out to industry. Uh, we expect to, to engage FMCSA in that process and to sort of help guide them from the perspective of motor carriers as to ways to improve CSA. Um, I obviously wrote this, uh, this particular slide before this preventative pro program uh, was introduced. It's coming, it's scheduled to start August 1st, so that's good now. And I think your CSA scores are gonna remain dark for the foreseeable future. Uh, the corrective action plan shouldn't be out till October. Um, and there's uh, a number of studies and things that'll, that'll have to happen before your, your scores uh, get, again, revealed to the public. So um, with that, I had some other issues, but we're running up against time. So we'd like to take a couple questions. I'll go right to the question slide and pass it over to Henry to see if uh, there's any questions that he'd like to answer first. Sure. I think uh, one of the questions I saw was on, you know, the president, the administration, and regulatory reform, and what they're doing. Um, <clears throat> this has been a really interesting issue, an exciting issue for our new administration. Um, you know, the president's really focused on this, cutting back some of the red tape, um, making sure regulations are based on sound science and industry input. You know, as we saw in the previous administration, when they put out an hours of service, you know, rule making based on, you know, a, a college student field study of, you know, when they best sleep and when they best perform, you know, there's a need to rework this regulatory process. So the administration is really focused on this. They've, they've put out their two-for-one rule, uh, executive order. Um, they've created regulatory task, force to, task, task forces in each agency, um, and this is going to be a, a really active issue area for them. Um, in Congress, the House has really moved on this. They've passed the RAINS Act. They've passed the Regulatory Accountability Relief Act and the Midnight Rule Relief Act. Um, in the Senate, they've also introduced the Regulatory Accountability Act. We as, an a we as ATA have, uh, have endorsed this legislation. Um, we are working with our friends in the Chamber of Commerce, uh, their uh, um, regulatory reform coalition, to flank them on this issue. Uh, this would, you know, this bill would require the adoption of the most cost-effective approaches on regulations, um, re require greater transparency, uh, more industry and public engagement, and uh, it would also <clears throat> codify several of the past executive orders over the past few presidents. So we think this is a really measured approach that will really help improve the regulatory process um, moving forward, and we're hopeful that the Senate will take it up. Sean? Excellent. We have a question which I had hoped to to answer during my remarks in the webinar, but but failed to do so. I so I appreciate the question. The question was, will we see any guidance uh, on hours of service, personal conveyance? And um, you know, the answer is that FMCSA has been preparing some guidance for personal conveyance. Um, the bad news is that it it probably won't be. Uh, exceptionally helpful to motor carriers. Motor carriers are probably hoping for answers to the question of what is reasonable when it comes to personal conveyance. And FMCSA is is definitely unlikely to determine uh, or to give motor carriers, say, uh, a number of miles uh, under which it's reasonable to drive on personal conveyance or an amount of time that is reasonable for somebody to operate under personal conveyance. What they're going to do is they're going to take the current current guidelines that's in the regulations, the guidance in the regulations, which is which is spread out throughout the regulations, and they're going to sort of consolidate them and hopefully answer some questions uh, around the perimeters. So they will produce, they will be issuing personal conveyance guidance, um, but they will not be answering that all too important question: uh, what is reasonable? Henry. Sure. I see another question here on uh, on hair testing and, uh, and an update on that. Um, this is an issue that you know we we've worked on for a while. Uh, we had some success in the um, the Fast Act. We included leg legislation that would direct the Department of Labor um, to produce uh, the guidance for hair testing, so that the Department of Transportation could move forward, so that hair testing could be used as an acceptable drug testing method. Now this 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 the language in the FAST Act, unfortunately, um, 
you know, it was it was said that it needed to be done within a year. Uh, they missed that deadline, and the department said, well, this is because the the administration is transitioning, and there's a new administration coming in, so we have to, you know, dot our I's and cross our T's. So <clears throat> the Trump administration is now in, and now we now have a new uh, HHS secretary, um, Tom Price, and so we've been working with both of them to educate them on this issue and push forward this issue. Uh, they are still going through their guidance process. Um, we have some some delays coming from uh, SAMHSA, um, but we're continuing to push and apply pressure where we can. We've got a lot of interest in this um, on Capitol Hill. We've had Chairman Thune of the Senate Commerce Committee lead a coalition letter um, encouraging them to move forward on this. We had Congressman Fleischman questioning Secretary Price directly during a hearing on this issue. So we're 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 really moving on this, and we're we're hopeful that this can be resolved uh, in the near term because um, you know this is a pro safety. This just makes sense for the industry, and we need to get past uh, HHS kind of slowing this down. Great. I see a question here uh, that's asking about the uh, preventability demonstration program, and and they're asking quite simply why carriers won't be allowed to contest accidents that happened prior to June of 2017. Uh, that is something that ATA argued for. We wanted sort of full retroactivity of um, of these crashes. Unfortunately, FMCSA uh, seems to indicate that, that that sort of thing will be a little bit too resource intensive for them. Uh, and because of the, the intensive nature of these sort of reviews, they won't be allowing carriers to contest older accidents, which, of course, again, ATA, um, ATA argued vigorously against but, but did not prevail. Uh, also, before I kick it back to Henry, I see a number of questions here requesting specific resources, and I wanted to um, let you know that we will be emailing out the various resources requested uh, following this call. And uh, with that, I'll send it back to Henry. Sure. Thanks, Sean. Um, I see another one that just came in on, uh, on truck speeds and the uh, the truck speed limits. Um, and a question of, there is there still a push for governing uh, truck speeds across the country? I think, you know, we saw a lot of, you know, we saw the late action by the Obama administration uh, last year. A lot of problems with that proposed rule. That's been dialed back. I cannot see, you know, this administration pursuing something on this uh, in the foreseeable future, but we're going to continue, obviously, having conversations with DOT and and with the, the appropriate um, congressional folks on this issue. Sean? Yes. Um, another question on accident preventability, where there will be, will there be a time limit to contest an accident? And moving forward, there won't be a time limit. Uh, as long as it's on your CSA profile, you'll be able to contest that accident. Uh, but bear in mind that it could take a little while from the beginning of when you start to contest it to when that issue will be resolved. So there's a, there's at least a 30-day uh, comment period for the public plus a little bit of time for the agency to finalize their review. And so um, trying to contest accidents that are exactly two years old uh, may not be as helpful because by the time uh, by the time that uh, that process is complete, that accident may have dropped off your CSA profile, uh, that your CSA profile anyway. So um, with that, I think uh, we're just about out of time. Uh, we see a number of questions still in the queue, so we'll be sure to get to those uh, offline. Uh, I think I'll send it back to Kent Ferguson and say uh, to Highright, thanks so much for having ATA on the call. It was It was our distinct pleasure, so thank you very much. Kent? Yeah, Sean, we appreciate you and Henry um, taking the time out of your day to provide this uh, update. Uh, and we want to thank everyone who attended today's presentation. Uh, please take a moment to complete the short survey, and we want to wish you guys a ha have a wonderful day. Thank you.